uh, which types of messages work, nor in general recent evidence much about whether these things work at all. And in terms of these backfire effects, like I said, there's a problem in that when you seem to give people the impression that things are common, that they happen a lot, even if the overall message is it's bad, don't do it, it still can make people apparently do this more. And there's some like, survey experiments that have been done by political scientists recently in Costa Rica that weren't in the context of um, trying to fight corruption. They were very explicitly just seeing, is there this type of self-reinforcing phenomenon? And they gave people information about corruption increasing in Costa Rica and then asked them, would you be willing to give a bribe? And the people who had been shown these flyers about corruption increasing compared to people who had not, dramatically increased how willing they themselves are to give a bribe. Whether it's because they think, oh, it's not so bad, or maybe I'm not getting something other people are getting. There's a number of things here that could be happening. But then it also opens the possibility that what if you kind of harness that social norms idea and said, well, look, things are maybe a little better than you thought. Could you flip that around and decrease corruption? And so these are the two ideas that I was playing with. Just to give you a sense of how, even though I'm using experiments here, this is very much what's happening immediately these days in Ukraine. In Ukraine. So on the left here, we've got pictures from uh, the airport in Kiev when you land, saying things like stop corruption. Uh, on the right, we have uh, a poster from an anti-corruption uh, seminar run at Kiev Mogila University. And as you see here, these, in, these, these numbers here are showing different ratings of corruption over time in Ukraine. So even though this is a, an, about fighting corruption, there is a message here that's being given to the students of corruption in Ukraine keeps increasing. And that's exactly the types of experiments that I tried to replicate in here. So the idea, because it's quite difficult to figure out what is the impact of people going throughout their day, getting this information in different forms, the idea behind here is to isolate some of these effects and in a survey show some people no information, some people information about fighting corruption but emphasizing a positive message like I have here on one side saying corruption is actually going down and another a negative message saying fight corruption we have to because it's going up and it's causing all these problems. So both of these here are of the idea that corruption is a bad thing, we want to fight it, but they're giving different underlying information. For what it's worth, these are both accurate, these are, these are accurate data in both cases. They're just from different sources and, and slightly different years um, to emphasize a different message. And then the thing that I was looking was a question of would you be willing to pay a bribe in order to receive a driver's license more quickly or easily? And I recognize that this is a sensitive question. I'd be happy to talk more about the degree of people who might be honest, dishonest when answering this question. Some other things that were done as well to approach this question in terms of more sensitive survey questions. And I get fairly similar results using those. I'm going to hold off on that for now. I mean, if people are interested, I'd be happy to talk more about it. But in terms of the results, what I find is that in the full sample, about 16.5% of people said yes. Openly, no problem. I would give a bribe to get my license quicker and more easily. You get somewhat of a decline about two percentage points, which is, you know, it seems modest, about 13% reduction uh, when you show them that corruption is actually decreasing and that's why they should be fighting it. You get less of a decline when you show the negative treatment, saying corruption is increasing, but that's why we have to fight it more. But if we look at other parts of the sample that we might expect, for example, younger people to be more susceptible to this type of information than older people, we see more dramatic effects. So when we look, for example, by age, and look at the younger people, we see something more like a three and a half percentage point drop that's much more noticeable. Part of that, though, is that the older people, whether this is that they're lying more or that they actually do engage in corruption less or that they just didn't think getting a driver's license was pertinent because they already have a driver's <laughs> license for many, many years, answer this question quite differently. So there's a low level to begin with, but there's also almost no movement in terms of how the information is affecting them. There's quite a bit of movement among the younger people. The one area where there is some evidence of a backfire effect is when you look at people's prior expectations. And so before seeing the flyers, there was some information asking, what is your expectation about the extent to which there's bribery in Ukraine? And unfortunately, there's not a lot of people in Ukraine who believe it's low. <laughs> but among mm -hmm. those who do believe it's low, that is those who believe that less than 40% of people give bribes in Ukraine, you do see a dramatic um, backfire effect among the, the negative treatment. That is when you tell people who think that corruption is sort of low, that is actually going up, you see an increase of about five percentage points in terms of willingness to give uh, bribes. On the other hand, when you take the people who really think that it's even more extensive than it is in Ukraine, who believe that 70% or more Ukrainians are giving bribes, you show them it's going down in this effort to fight corruption, you get a more dramatic effect than anything else we've seen, about a 7% drop here between the black and the striped line 
in the middle. Before I wrap up, I want to talk briefly about one additional um, experiment that, was, that, I, that I took this a little bit further. So survey experiments are nice in that it was covering the entire country. Um, but it's just something hypothetically saying, would you give a bribe or not? And of course, for a number of reasons, it's quite difficult to go out and actually get people to give real bribes and see how it can affect them and so on. And so one way that's increasingly been used to look at this is by putting students in laboratory games where they play for real money. I'd be happy to again talk more about the extent to which these games reflect reality. I didn't used to believe they do, and now I'm a believer. And so I'd be happy to talk about why I think that these are not entirely artificial, even though it may seem somewhat strange to put students in the lab and say, pretend you're a bureaucrat, become your citizen, and see how they react. So again, something I'd be happy to talk more about. But the key here is that people are gaining or losing real money based on the decisions that they make. And in this role-playing game, uh, this was done with Ukrainian uh, university students at a, at a legal academy. Uh, in this role-playing game, basically, the person assigned to play the role of a citizen was trying to get a permit. And in order to get the permit and get more money in real life by getting that permit, they had to pay a bribe. And if the bureaucrat accepted that, the bureaucrat and the citizen could get more money. I focused, because I didn't have the same number, I only had um, about uh, 700 students participating in this instead of thousands like I had in the national sample. So I focused just on one of the messages, the ones that seemed stronger, the positive message, because also I wanted to see if you could do something with this positive social norms idea that you could reduce corruption by saying corruption is going down. And again, this brings the focus back to the people we might expect this to matter most for, young people. And indeed, showing before they play this game, so half the group was showing this flyer and half was not. And before they play this game, about 10 minutes after they do some other, they see the flyer, then they do some other things, and then they play this game. It has a dramatic effect, both overall, in terms of the percent of students in either position, the citizen or the bureaucrat, in participating in a bribe transaction, dropping from 32.2%, who did it to 24.8%. And the biggest effect happens to be with the citizens. That is, the ones who are playing the role of bureaucrat, this had less of an effect on them. But on the ones who are specifically in the role of citizen, after being told that your fellow citizens are engaging in corruption less than perhaps you thought they were, or that at least it's headed in a good direction, and being prompted to think, we need to fight corruption together, had a dramatic effect here of almost 12 percentage points, so a really significant change. So I'll wrap up with that. I'd be happy to give more details about either of those experiments and ways to interpret them. Um, but the preliminary evidence here is that there is something to this idea of using positive messaging. That if we're going to use information, the idea of using something saying things are getting better, join in this, rather than look at how bad things are or things are getting worse, we have to fight it, could have pretty significant effects. These effects are strongest among younger people, not surprisingly. And there's limited evidence of the backfire issue here, but it is present potentially in something that sh people should be paying attention to. <laughs> There's, of course, a number of things that still need to be looked at. This is artificial in the sense that this is just something that's to be seen once. In Ukraine, you're constantly seeing these things on every bus stop. So what's the impact of this over time? What's the difference in terms of seeing a flyer versus videos versus TV and so on? And finally, uh, what's the difference between the message in terms of the actual words and content and the visuals and things like that? So there's lots more to do. Um, this is just one first step in this project, but I do think that there is something to all this information that's being used Unfortunately, my impression, particularly when I, I did interviews with a lot of the, the different organizations, both foreign and domestic in Ukraine, who are putting out these flyers, is being done in an incredibly haphazard way. Um, with no coordination among the, the 10 different groups putting these out, no assessment about what works, not even a whole lot of forethought about whether or not it's a good idea what they're doing, more just what would get people's attention to look at this. Which is good, we need to raise people's thinking about corruption, but as I think many people in this room know, most people in Ukraine are already quite aware of this corruption, uh, and more something a little more sophisticated needs to happen in order for it to be fought. Thanks very much, and I look forward to questions later on. Thanks, Jordan. Sorry for the mix up with the no title. Um, I'm pretty sure I have the right title for the next presentation. Uh, we have uh, Oleksiy Hanan from uh, Kiev Mohila Academy. Uh, presenting a paper on um, the uh, Ukraine's big election year. Winners take a toll. Okay. Slides will be at the end. Okay. Ah, okay. 
Okay, to follow on a corruption topic, I would say that I'm representing a non-corrupt institution, which is Kiev McGill Academy, and we do not have, we do not have corruption since the founding, refounding of Kiev McGill, which happened in 1992, and at that time nobody believed it was possible to have corruption-free university, but we did it, and we are very happy that now the system of external independent evaluation is is active throughout the country, which actually makes the entrance to universities corruption free. Okay, but now I'm to talk, so it means that something is possible to do, even if you have perception of total corruption. Oh, by the way, one more example of non-corruption, biometric passport. You know, in Soviet system to get foreign passport, all these queues, and it was incredibly, incredibly difficult and involving some small bribes and all this stuff with biometric passports. It's very, very easy, pleasant, people are smiling to you. <laughs> so now, ten, now Ukrainians uh, received, ten, 10 million Ukrainians received uh, biometric passport uh, without bribes. Okay. Uh, now, let's go to the topic of Ukrainian elections. The good thing about Ukraine, as you know, is we do not know results of any elections. So elections do matter and electoral choice uh, do matter. At this point, there's no clear leader and all the leaders are very, very close. One of the problem is that unfortunately there's no clear candidate whom we can call a liberal reformer. We have a group of bright, democratically oriented people, but they are competing with each other. They appear to be unable to form a unified force. So I would say that among people who have the chances to be uh, elected in co according, to, according to the polls are Timoshenko, Poroshenko, I would add former Minister of Defense Gritsenko, who present Timoshenko and Poroshenko, they considered to be old faces, okay? Gritsenko presents himself as new face, in fact, he's old face, mm -hmm. but it's, 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 it's not a problem, I believe, because I consider him to be a personal and honest guy who is really in favor of reforms, but one of his, we don't know about much about his potential team, and actually he appointed his chief of staff, Mr. Baloga, who is a man of the past. So, if we expect that any of these candidates would win the elections, and again, we don't know exactly who it would be in the second round. Perhaps Mr. Moshenka, but who will be competitor, we don't know. Uh, if anybody of these uh, would win elections, I would predict there would be a slow zigzag economic reforms and approximation to Europe because we have this association agreement. So there would be a gradual moving forward with zigzags and uh, uh, definitely uh, it doesn't mean there would be radical, radical reforms. Uh, with Timoshenko we have a problem. The problem is that actually if she is elected, she is very strong person and she there is a danger that she can mono, try to monopolize power. Okay, uh, Poroshenko also tried to to uh, do it, but actually not very efficiently. And one of the good things for Ukraine is that we have a constitutional balance system. Okay, so the government is formed according to the results of parliamentary elections. Prime Minister is appointed by the ruling coalition and president doesn't have uh, possibility to dismiss him. So basically they have to coexist, and the government is to rely on the uh, coalition in the parliament. Uh, which means that whoever is elected, his power, elected president, his power would be counterbalanced by parliament. And we have elections in uh, March, April, presidential elections next year, and in October we'll have parliamentary elections. So actually a lot would depend on who will be on the results of parliamentary elections. And here comes the question of potential Russian interference. Uh, theoretically, there could be a pro-Russian candidate in the second round if we have two pro-Russian, well, let's say pro-Russian candidates, schematically described pro-Russian candidates, and if they join their efforts, which is not clear, 
So theoretically, there could be one pro-Russian candidate in the second round, but he doesn't have a chances to win. So what Russia may, uh, may design? Actually, to use parliamentary elections and to, again, pro-Russian forces would not get the majority, it's clear, uh, according to all the polls, but they, would, they could influence somehow creating of coalition manipulation behind the scene in the parliament, trying to destabilize the situation and to have a prime minister who would be, say, more comfortable to Russia than the present one. In order to interfere in the elections, uh, Russia has actually a lot of, still have a lot of uh, potential because, for example, from informational point of view, three large informational channels are reflects, to a great extent, pro-Russian position. Uh, one inter is owned by former chief of staff of President Yanukovych, Mr. Lovachkin. Talented guy, but I would say he's fighting on the side of evil. Uh, then uh, the second one, uh, which is news one, is controlled by his deputy chief of staff in the administration of President Yanukovych, the guy is now in Moscow, he escaped from Ukraine, but somehow he managed to control this channel. And finally, the third channel, 112, 120, is controlled by Mr. Medvedchuk, and Putin is, is godfather of uh, his daughter. Okay, so they're very, very closely connected to, uh, to Russia. And definitely Russia, what Russia is trying to use is uh, trying to use the rules of democratic game in order to undermine Ukraine democracy. Okay. And this is a paradox, because the country is at war, and Poroshenko didn't introduce emergency situation in 2014-2015. He's proud of it. He's saying openly that I'm proud that even in time of war, uh, we didn't introduce, so there is freedom. Actually, I think that it was a mistake, and after elections of the parliament in 2014, and after Debaltsev, actually, what happened at the front line, he had all the possibilities to introduce this emergency situation. Um, in time, in time of war, at least in the Donbass, at least in two <coughs> but he didn't do that. Um, and I would say that at this point, the level, given the wartime situation, the level of Ukrainian democracy, including mass media freedom, uh, is unprecedented. So this is a paradox. And this is used by Putin. So this is one of the paradoxes of Ukrainian situation and Ukrainian-Russian uh, relations. OK, now I have how many? Three minutes. So let me. The issue of the war can help me. The issue of the war in the Donbass, how it will play uh, in the parliamentary elections. So it's important to understand that most Ukrainian, most Ukrainians, more than fifty percent, uh, are in favor of compromises, but not all. So basically, I would say the radicals who are in favor of military solution and those who, would, who are ready to agree to everything which Putin is proposing are in minority on the flanks. Majority of Ukrainians are in favor of compromises, but not all. And then we're asking the question, so what compromises for you are acceptable and what are not acceptable? Not acceptable, actually everything which is demanded by Putin or which is written in the political part of Minsk agreements. Ukrainians doesn't buy it. So what does it mean? It means that, for example, if uh, our Western partners are pressing on Ukraine to implement first political part of Minsk agreements and then the security part, it would mean destabilization of the government. According to the logic of Minsk agreement, security first, and then political part, which is not very favorable for Ukraine. 
uh, but given the present situation, actually any pressure on Ukraine and even desire of Poroshenko or other government or would be president to uh, adopt one of these would mean destabilization of uh, of Ukrainian would mean destabilization on Ukraine. Big question: To what compromises Ukrainians are ready? And because I don't have time, and I have presentation, we agreed, because I have results of recent polls, we agreed that I would be given a slot in the next panel on the Donbass. Thank you for this. And I will show it to you to what compromises Ukrainians are ready. So we'll keep in three. Stay tuned. After this commercial break. That's right. <laughs> Uh, third, we have uh, Volodymyr uh, Dubovik from uh, Mechnikov National University in Odessa, dissecting Trump's administration's policy on Ukraine. That's right, an easy subject. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is not. Oh, it is not. Right. Well, an easy subject indeed, and uh, 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 I've been talking about U.S.-Ukraine relations, including in the format of honors uh, in your conferences for a number of years now. And that's a fascinating uh, topic as ever uh, this time. We are now well into the second year of uh, Donald Trump's presidency and there's a lot to talk about. Uh, Ukraine-US relations were off to the uh, uh, low start initially when Trump came to the White House for the primary reason of uh, Ukrainians betting on the wrong horse in 2016. And of course, that's never been f forgotten, I believe, and never will be forgotten by the people who are occupying the White House now. Uh, Ukrainians, of course, were very troubled by the statements uh, made by Trump on the campaign trail, and that, of course, made them uh, very much favoring uh, his opponent, and uh, that's uh, harmed him a lot. And we can also remember that uh, the materials and some information uh, that was provided by uh, people in Ukraine toppled or made the, the, to, to leave the, the campaign chair for Manafort. And Manafort being on trial, this Ukraine connection is always there in the press. And I'm not sure necessarily that's making us uh, look good <laughs> every time we read an article about Manafort doing this, this or that. I mean, surprisingly, you know, the last piece of information was that he was very much involved in pushing uh, the signing of the cessation agreement and the European integration of Ukraine. So there are pluses and minuses, I suppose. As we remember, the Kovic administration was quite active in preparing for the signing in, in Vilnius for at least two years prior to abruptly cancelling the signing uh, 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 then in 20. Uh, 2014. Um, well, uh, surprisingly, though, there is a, a, a huge amount of continuity in U.S. policy towards Ukraine. Um, surprisingly, if you look at the Donald Trump's impulses and his statements and his constant praising of uh, Mr. Putin and him questioning uh, whether Crimea should be recognized as a part of Russian Federation, perhaps. At least he did so on campaign trail. I don't think he did anything like this since he became president. Uh, uh, so that's why I use this uh, term, surprisingly. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's not uh, anything new, uh, and it's not just on Ukraine. Uh, the mention of this country's foreign policy, that there are many foreign policies of this country. And it's hard to dissect them indeed, and many people are confused in Ukraine as well. Every time the U.S. does something to support Ukraine, people begin to say, well, that's Donald Trump. See, he's, uh, he's actually great for Ukraine. And then others begin to say, well, it's probably not him. As sometimes it's actually despite <laughs> what the president says or does that his administration still does some positive things on Ukraine. So that's complicated. It's very confusing even for scholars, let alone some uh, you know, average Ukrainians who are trying to come up with uh, ideas to uh, uh, is it good or bad thing that Trump is a president for Ukraine. Uh, the sanctions are still there, and of course they are. It's the only instrument, only real viable instrument that any country in the West, including US, have uh, basically to, to uh, 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 impact on Russia's behavior. Uh, are they biting? I think they are. I remember the previous president has been saying it's a number of occasions that the sanctions are working, and I think they are, but it's hard to estimate how well they are working. Obviously, they haven't uh, led to the Russians altering their behavior in a dramatic way. Obviously not. Uh, but there are many other uh, uh, indicators. Uh, and who knows, uh, if there is no sanctions, what Russian behavior would be. It could have been much more aggressive line towards Ukraine. Even it could be a deeper incursions. It could be more of aggression and so on. So 
I mean, uh, sanctions, I think they are working. And also what matters is not just uh, sanctions laws being signed, uh, but also how they implement it. Uh, because as we all well know, there are many laws on sanctions in the recent years, and there are some in the works right now on the Hill. Uh, but the, what matters is how they implement it. Unfortunately, many of the previous sanctions have uh, left a lot of loopholes and ways around the sanctions, and those were used uh, by Russians to, to actually avoid the punishment for their wrongdoings towards Ukraine. Of course, there is financial, project, uh, financial uh, support provided to Ukraine. There are many projects funded by US in Ukraine, and actually we had a meeting yesterday at the Foreign Service Institute with a bunch of, yeah, with a bunch of uh, incoming diplomats uh, coming to Ukraine, training uh, to go to the US Embassy in, in Kyiv, and I begged them to do a better job in terms of disseminating knowledge about what US is doing, what sort of projects they're supporting in Ukraine, because a lot of people in Ukraine are just not aware of that, and that's, and that's bad, because actually it's a very impressive long list of projects that the US is helping us to deal with. Uh, the reforms are there as well on the agenda, of course. Uh, uh, basically, the Ukrainian civil society, NGOs, activists on one si uh, side, and then the West, the US government in this case, and the other side, are becoming the major allies in terms of pushing our government to, and making them, and pushing them to do the right thing. Uh, that's unfortunate, of course, that uh, our government requires such a little push in, in the right direction, but that's uh, how it is, and we appreciate American help there. The issue of corruption is something that we talk about a lot about in Ukraine. Uh, that's uh, already progress, because for a number of years corruption was there, but we didn't really talk much about it publicly. Now it's almost like an obsession uh, uh, with the issue of corruption. Everybody talks about it. So that's already a step forward. I mean, first you need to talk about the issue, and then you probably find some recipes and some solutions. Uh, American uh, position here was very important in defending the National Anti-Corruption Bureau of Ukraine, uh, defending the idea of creation of an uh, anti-corruption court. So there are many, many ways that Americans are uh, helpful there, to the extent that some people are complaining in Ukraine, like, uh, why are they even interfering with our affairs, uh, uh, there is this idea of uh, you know, the external management that people bring up quite often. Uh, and uh, I actually, a couple of years ago here at the Bonners, uh, uh, I presented a memo which was entitled, Is Ukraine Becoming Client State of the US? So, I don't think so. <laughs> that's, what I, that's the conclusion I've reached, reached in that memo. Uh, but th there is a role for, for US to play. And also, uh, uh, the, the Donbass and Crimea, two issues are important, of course, and the American position here is important. Uh, I've, I've listened to uh, Ambassador Kurt Walker speaking about this at the Yalta European Strategy just a few days ago in Kyiv. Uh, basically, uh, he says that Minsk remains uh, relevant. Uh, however, uh, not so much in terms of a way to resolve the conflict, m meaning that Ukraine, in his opinion, fulfilled much of its obligations. Maybe not all of those, but much of the obligations in the face of other side really not doing anything. And then, and then in terms of fulfilling those obligations. And then who is that other side? The problem with Minsk, of course, that uh, they make Kiev talk to DNR and LNR, but they're nobodies. I mean, that's, <laughs> this really should be Russia there, <laughs> who you talk to about the future of Donbass resolution of settlement, right? So uh, US is sort of back here with Walker, uh, Walker Surkov uh, format, but that's not really coming forward uh, any successfully. Yeah, or there's not much progress being made, for instance, uh, Kurt Walker has been pushing this idea of uh, peacekeeping force being placed in Donbass, but the Russians are stalling. Their, way, their position on this is it's either our uh, uh, you know, model of how should we implement it, uh, put in place, or nothing is happening. So, and that's exactly what's going on. Nothing is happening because, of course, the Russian model of peacekeeping force there is just a, a way to make it a frozen conflict, which might have been even a progress because right now it's not frozen, and right now we, people are dying on the daily, you know, as we speak on a daily basis, so maybe making Donbass a frozen conflict would be a step forward in a way, you know, paradoxically, ironically, if I might say. Uh, but um, it is how it is. On Crimea, of course, it's a difficult situation. Uh, it's incorporated uh, de, de facto into Russian Federation. Uh, we appreciated the Crimean Declaration, which was pushed forward on July 25th. However, Crimean Declaration on a little uh, mentioning of, uh, of the, the, the Stimson Declaration from 1940, 
uh, was in, oh, it wasn't Stimson. Anyway, from, from, from the Baltics declaration uh, from 1940, that's interesting because that tells you that American government doesn't see any, any quick and easy solution to Crimea, and basically it's uh, declaring that they're prepared to play a long game on Crimea uh, in terms of trying to push it in the direction that Crimea would be returned to Ukraine's uh, fault, but that's not easy to do. Uh, most finally, uh, uh, then normalizing Putin uh, is something that we don't uh, s uh, like to see in Ukraine of, a, of uh, something uh, similar to what happened in Helsinki primarily, which was really, I think, an embarrassment uh, for, for the foreign policies, uh, foreign policy of this country. Uh, I mean, I'm not arguing that uh, Russia should be isolated, that there should be no dialogue. I think there should be a dialogue and the line of contact should be opened. But any accommodation or understanding or even more so normalizing uh, uh, Putin and his regime, that's uh, something that should be done. Because actually that's what he cares a lot about, uh, uh, becoming back as a normal part, a member of international community. And he is not. And he should be reminded about that at every corner, that what he did to Ukraine and still doing to Ukraine makes him a cry. Uh, I think that's my position. That's the position of many of us in Ukraine. Uh, most finally, there is a military assistance. And just a few days ago, I think, there was another package uh, allocated for 250 million. Uh, and uh, there is a talk maybe about more little weapons being delivered to Ukraine from this country. We'll see. Uh, the javelins are there. It's not really a game changer. It's not something that would allow Ukraine to win the war against Russia. That never was the rationale, and a lot of people just misunderstood that. Uh, but it's something meaningful, though, uh, uh, in symbolic uh, sense, primarily, because Ukrainians, Ukrainians want to know and understand that they are standing there not alone, not just vis-a-vis -vis this asymmetric conflict with Russia, that we're getting some support. And I'm concluding here. Elections are coming up in Ukraine, as uh, uh, Alexei has mentioned already, and I'm, I'm sure that maybe Volodymyr will <laughs> probably mention that as well in his presentation. Uh, a lot of people in Ukraine are jockeying for U.S. support, but of course, as always, I think Washington should refrain from putting any stakes or bets or any eggs in one basket. They should uh, really stand up for the principles, for the right thing, for the for the election process to be free and fair. It would be regrettable if there would be some uh, regress in that in Ukraine's elections because we haven't seen any administrative resource, for instance, being uh, implemented in Ukraine's uh, elections anytime uh, recently. Uh, and that will be uh, something uh, for US administration observers also to watch out for, and that Ukraine remains uh, a, a democracy, maybe a flawed democracy, maybe sometimes a messy democracy, but at the same time, there will be no violation of the free and fair uh, election process. Thank you. Our fourth uh, presenter is Volodymyr Kul uh, Kulik from uh, Kuras Institute of Political and Ethnic Studies in Kiev. And he will talk about religion and geopolitics. Kiev and Moscow clash over the Constantinople Patriarchy's decision on Ukrainian autocephaly. Thank you, Maria. Thank, uh, thank you, all, all of you, for coming. Uh, I'm, I'm not a specialist in religion or religious politics, and uh, to me it's uh, part of an identity politics which I've been studying uh, for, for many years, and this uh, uh, part became uh, prominent rather unexpectedly to all of us, except maybe a narrow circle of people who, who uh, have access to, the, to information about uh, uh, closed-door negotiations. So to us, uh, it became prominent unexpectedly on 17th April, uh, April 2018, when President Poroshenko summoned uh, the leaders of uh, parliamentary factions uh, to tell them that Ukraine was, in his word, as close as ever to obtaining autocephaly for its Orthodox Church, but also ask them to help to achieve this supposedly common goal uh, by uh, um, uh, encouraging or actually pressuring maybe somewhat uh, members of their factions to uh, support the appeal of, of the parliament to consider the party of Bartholomew. So uh, who uh, is expected, uh, or the patriarchy is expected to, to, to grant this autocephaly? Um, 
So Ukrainian Church is uh, uh, partly part of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church is dependent on, on, on Moscow, and uh, or Constantinople is, of course, uh, the um, the most powerful and the most obvious alternative to that uh, center of, of uh, Orthodox power, and uh, it's particularly called ecumenical. Uh, Zelensky as yes, meaning. Uh, First among equal, uh, and uh, if now is, is Constantinople and Moscow are debating this uh, matters of this uh, equality and pri versus primacy. Yeah, uh, but I will not, not go into de uh, detail of that. Uh, I would rather I would rather mention uh, the uh, domestic Ukrainian aspects of of, of, of this process uh, and uh, how it uh, may affect domestic Ukrainian politics, but also ge geopolitical dimension, the clash between Moscow. And, and and key, but also involving other foreign foreign um, powers, foreign um, uh, centers. So uh, this appeal Poroshenko uh, called for was adopted by the parliament two days later. In addition to to this, two of three Ukraine main, uh, Ukrainian main Orthodox churches appealed independently to to the uh, to the to grant autocephaly. So given this seemingly broad appeal, even though it excluded one large part of Ukrainian Orthodox, namely that part which is subordinated uh, or loyal to Moscow, uh, it, it could be interpreted as reflecting the general or almost general will of the Ukrainian population, something which was lacking in the past. and, and uh, uh, given the will of, of the patriarch himself to, to interpret it this way, he could start a process which is supposed to lead to actually obtaining autocephaly uh, sometime soon. Uh, so uh, uh, it might lead to, or uh, if we are fortunate, uh, might lead to the unification of Ukrainian Orthodox, which are currently, uh, who are currently divided between three denominations, uh, or might 